and you will see the work they did shortly. And finally, I want to thank Dr. Hector Flores, um, without whom none of these connections would have happened. So with that, what I want to talk about tonight is mobilizing America, World War I posters, and the construction of American identity. So part one, American, the American policy of neutrality in World War I ended on April 6, 1917, when President Woodrow Wilson declared war almost three years after fighting had begun in Europe. Motivated by several events in early 1917, Wilson's action directly contradicted the isolationist position promoted in his 1916 re-election campaign slogan, he kept us out of war. That slogan had been responsible for his very narrow re-election victory. So in order to justify um, the reversal of national policy and to mobilize popular support for it, Wilson had to convince the public that war was unavoidable, patriotic, and moral. To accomplish this task, he created the Committee on Public Information. And this was created by executive order one week after the declaration of war, technically on April 13, 1917. Wilson charged the committee with presenting, quote, the absolute justice of America's cause, end quote, and again another quote, and the absolute selflessness of America's aims, end quote. The primary purpose of the CPI was to forge unified public support for US, partic uh, U.S. participation in the war by first clearly depicting why we must fight. And that's kind of in quotations because for World War II there was a whole series of films made why we must fight. And secondly, the other major purpose of the CPI was directly persuading all Americans to actively participate in the war effort by enlisting in the armed services, and or investing in war bonds, and or conserving vital resources. To oversee this effort to win American hearts and minds, Wilson chose journalist George Creel to head the CPI. Even at this early stage in the development of mass media, Creel understood its power to shape public <coughs> opinion. Although Wilson had favored censorship legislation, to control what the public heard about the war, Creel persuaded him that an all-out multimedia publicity campaign that communicated coordinated messages about the administration's aims for war and peace would be a far more successful tactic to control what the public saw and heard. After the war, Creel described the work of the CPI as follows, and I'm quoting from a book he wrote, in all things from first to last, Without halt or change, it was a plain publicity proposition, a vast enterprise in salesmanship, the world's greatest adventure in advertising. There was no part of the great war machinery that we did not touch, no medium of appeal that we did not employ. In an era before radio and television, not to mention the internet, the Committee for Public Information wanted Americans to hear and see consistent messages on a daily basis, repeated through all the media, in pictures and words, in diverse arrays of public places, plastered on as many exterior walls as possible, and posted inside public and private buildings, basically bombarding people any way and every place they went. To accomplish this amount of work, the CPI was divided into 21 domestic divisions and 16 foreign ones. And these numbers are a little bit um, iffy. Each source tells you a different number. Um, but these divisions ultimately mobilized the efforts of more than 150,000 men and women. The domestic divisions included divisions of news, film, advertising, syndicated features, women's war work, production and distribution, and the Division of Pictorial Publicity, the DPP, which oversaw the production of the war posters. So we're going to narrow our focus down now to the DPP. The Division of Pictorial Publicity was launched nine days after Wilson had named Creel the head of the CPI. 
Creel understood the poster to be a major tool of mass communication. He wrote, quote, I had the conviction that the poster must play a great part in the fight for public opinion. The printed word might not be read. People might not choose to attend meetings or to watch motion pictures. But the billboard, which is what the poster was called, was something that caught even the most indifferent eye. What we wanted, what we had to have, were posters that represented the best work of the best artists. Now this is a loaded statement. What did he mean by the best artists? What he meant specifically were those artists who were already working for the mass media, creating illustrations for popular magazines, books, and advertisements. Creel chose Charles Dana Gibson, one of America's most famous, popular, and financially successful illustrators, um, to head the DPP. And Gibson was also an ardent and early supporter of America's entry into the war. Charles Dana Gibson is best known for his creation of the Gibson Girl, and I'll show you some pictures of her in a little while. The Gibson Girl is the embodiment of the new woman in the 1890s and 1900s. And Gibson was so successful in his career that he actually paid all of the, the expenses of the DPP out of his own pocket. Um, the illustrators he chose to work for the DPP were, for the most part, classically trained academic artists um, who had chosen, like Gibson, to work for the commercial mass media. They ultimately produced 700 different poster designs for the DPP, from which approximately 20 to 25 million posters were printed. The DPP served the needs of many government departments and civilian agencies, such as the Food Administration, the Marine Corps, the Signal Corps, the American Red Cross, the War Savings Stamps, and the four Liberty Loan Drives. Some of the artists worked for other agencies not served by the DPP, such as the YMCA and the US Navy. All told, approximately two to three thousand original poster designs were created by American illustrators, all of whom volunteered their work, receiving no pay at all, despite the fact that some of them charged between $1,000 and $10,000 a piece for their commercial work. The success of their effort was attested to at a victory dinner held in February 1919, honoring those who had served in the DPP. A high official stated, quote, Charles Dana Gibson and his cadre of artists did work of immense value in helping to win the war. Their services were of more value to the government in helping to shape public opinion than all of the other agencies together." End quote. Although there is no definitive way to prove exactly how influential the posters truly were in shaping public opinion, one can at least hypothesize about their financial effectiveness. At the end of the First World War, the U.S. House of Representatives Ways and Means Committee estimated that the war had cost the United States over $30 million. Now, I should mention that it was entirely paid for by the end of the war. Um, Two-thirds of the money that went to pay for the <coughs> war were raised by the four Liberty Loan campaigns um, that were heavily promoted by the posters that we're going to talk about in just a minute. Now, that doesn't mean that there weren't other ways. Um, many movie stars <coughs> went on the campaign trail <coughs> to raise money for the Liberty Bonds as well. So we can't say that the, the posters were exclusively um, responsible for that kind of financial gain, but they definitely played a part. Okay, part two. The antecedents in advertising imagery. The American Girl and the Manly Man. And this is not to be confused with Arnold's Girly Man, okay? The prominence of posters in Dana and Creel's campaign to sell the war to the American public was due to the fact that by the beginning of World War I, posters were a mature advertising tool as well as artistic medium. Posters were, most common, were the most commonly used mass communication method at this time. They were both familiar and ubiquitous, forming a kind of wallpaper on the streets. And you see in the far image, the walls are totally plastered, and people go by every day and put new posters on top of the old ones. Already established as a means to communicate essential information rapidly and efficiently, advertising <coughs> posters were large-sized, full-color, and cheaply printed in large numbers. 
illustrators of advertising posters had honed their abilities to communicate a clear, persuasive, and emotionally moving message that instilled in viewers the desire to own a consumer item and the impetus to act on that desire. Desire is a big concept in all of these posters. The adaptation of the poster from selling consumer products to selling the war was not a tremendous reach for the TPP or for the illustrators working for it. While World War I marked the first time that posters were used in the US for political purposes on such a large scale, these posters were only a slight modification of the commercial advertising posters that were simultaneously being created by the same illustrators. Although much of the existing scholarship on the American World War I posters interprets them from the perspective of government-sponsored propaganda. That approach, in my opinion, tends to obscure the artistic and commercial contexts of the posters and to oversimplify their public reception. The best known illustrators of the American World War I posters, and there are examples by all four of these men in the gallery, were Howard Chandler Christie, Harrison Fisher, James Montgomery Flagg, and J.C. Landauer. Two other illustrators closely associated with commercial work of the period did not make war posters. Charles Dana Gibson, although the head of the DPP, had retired from commercial work in 1905, and although there are very few posters that come from his artwork, he was not this kind of poster illustrator. And the other one was Norman Rockwell. Uh, Rockwell was very young. I will show you a couple of images by him, but he um, was still illustrating boys' magazines and just getting his start with the Saturday Evening Post. So there are no war posters that I know done by him. The four central illustrators of the World War I poster, and they're, they're laid out in order, um, Christie, Fisher, Flagg, and Landecker, were all born in the 1870s, and all but Fisher lived until the 1950s. One of them actually lived into the 1960s, I can't remember which one. All four had very traditional art educations, studying first at art institutes in their native cities, then moving on to art academies in New York, London, and or Paris. Flagg, the one who's the best known for, you know, the Uncle Sam image, I want you, actually exhibited paintings in the Paris Salon of 1900 alongside of academic painters from the Academy Julienne. This is really mind-blowing. All four men were also lured away from academic painting careers in the early years of the 20th century into the burgeoning world of commercial illustration and made careers painting covers and article illustrations for major American magazines like Scribner's, Collier's, Harper's, Wesley's Weekly, the Saturday Evening Post, Cosmopolitan, McClure's, and the, Saturday, uh, the Ladies' Home Journal. They also illustrated advertisements that appeared in those same magazines alongside their other work. All four men were also very financially successful. Christie's annual earnings reached $50,000 by 1910, and there was no income tax at this point, and Fisher's reached $75,000 by 1913. Finally, all four of them were associated with the creation of an ideal type of contemporary American youth in their work. Christie, Fisher, and Flagg developed versions of beautiful, feminine, modern young women who became known as the Christie Girl, the Fisher Girl, and not too surprisingly, the Flag Girl. Lane Decker created the ideal, handsome, masculine, modern young man who became known as the Arrow Collar Man because he was, appeared mostly in those ads. Okay. An evolution in the depiction of the American woman began in the mid 1890s as the 19th century concept of the true woman was eclipsed by the more modern new woman who was a uniquely American symbol of the rejection of Victorian constraints. The new woman was conceptualized as a young woman, probably in her late teens, who, before her inevitable marriage, experienced such new freedoms as attending college, enjoying outdoor sporting activities, and driving cars. As first depicted in the illustrations of Charles Dana Gibson, 
And this whole group is from the tenure period of around 1895 to 1905. This is the classic Gibson girl, as she became known. She was tall, self-possessed, well-dressed, beautiful. Um, she was a young woman with an hourglass figure. And you can see the model on this side. There's a lot of question about who or how many women actually modeled for the Gibson girl, but this is what they all looked like. And she has her long hair pulled up in a bouffant fronted chignon. Um, at this point, the women still have very long hair. She was also, <clears throat> excuse me, white, native born, Christian, and wealthy. And so she had little need for, or interest in, advocating for political suffrage or financial independence. The Gibson Girl represented a complex response to the emerging, feminized, consumer-based modern world. And, in res and the responses to her were as Im ambiguous as they were to modernity. While some contemporary feminists, like Charlotte Perkins Gilman, saw her as the model of the new enlightened woman, she was denigrated by others as a self-willed woman who emasculated men. Now, these are the images that are somehow never shown in the oeuvre of Gibson. And this is what, I'll show you some more of his work and also some other illustrators. But she was a very strong figure. And these are two illustrations. You see the man unable to choose between the two lovely young women who are both tempting him. And you see their poses with their tilted head, their pursed lips. Um, glancing down their eyelids, the elderly man here flitting between all these choices of young girls who are, of course, gold diggers. Um, but there's a, a very much, a, a great ambiguous um, thing going on here. The ambiguity toward the new woman highlights a period of flux in gender definitions in the decades before World War I that ushered in crises in both gender identity and national identity. As the new woman's world expanded from the private to the public realm, allowing her to engage in work, paid or volunteer, social clubs, and recreation, her greater freedom of movement seems to inversely reflect the decline in power, um, freedom, and autonomy of men. And probably two of the most famous Gibson images are the ones on the far side, where you see four Gibson girls with a magnifying glass, examining with a knife, a, a, a dissecting knife, a little man. Okay? And then in the next one, the woman who, in profile, where her hair creates a kind of question mark. This was the infamous Evelyn Nesbitt, who was involved in the most famous sex scandal of the day. And then you see the dangerous toy. Um, and who is the toy and who is dangerous? we can you know, surmise what he's talking about. Um, okay, Several major social changes of the period collaborated in making men feel they no longer measured up to traditional criteria of manhood. The rise of large corporations endangered the economic autonomy of independent entrepreneurs. The shift from manual labor to office jobs stripped men of traditional physical labor. The transition to factory production endangered the status of skilled artisans, and the concentration of work in the growing multicultural and multi-ethnic cities raised anxieties in native-born white men who saw their political and social dominance waned. And here are a couple of other illustrations by a man named Clarence Coles Phillips. These are Life magazine covers. Um, and you can see uh, the woman in orange with a clock that has men instead of numbers, uh, the woman with the spider web um, that has all these little men caught in them. And in each of these, the women are huge and contemporary, and the men are very diminutive. Gives you some idea of how scary this is getting to be. Manhood, which had been synonymous with adulthood, is increasingly seen as unobtainable. Fears of bail enfeeblement, and by extension, national enfeeblement, ignited a crisis in masculinity, exacerbated by the perceived sexual aggressiveness of the new woman. Masculinity was increasingly being constructed as the opposite of femininity, and the feminized man, the sissy, was wildly ridiculed. And I'm showing you some illustrations. These are all by the very young Norman Rockwell. And he has a character in here called Cousin Reginald, 
who is the archetypal sissy. And the sissy always wears a little Lord Fauntleroy outfit, like you see in the one on this side, where he wins the spelling bee. But poor cousin Reginald can't do anything manly. He, he's out to kill the turkey for Thanksgiving, but the turkey chases him. Um, everybody's going swimming, and they're wearing modern swimming clothes, but he's wearing old-fashioned clothes and can only put his toe in the water. So this is a long-running character that um, Norman Rockwell developed. So the conflict between the new and old constructs of womanhood and manhood were played out in various popular media, perhaps most centrally in the mass circulation magazines, which also experienced a rapid growth in these years. In the American magazines of the first and second decade of the 20th century, illustrators created images that worked to tame and control the new woman's sexuality while simultaneously reinvigorating American manhood. The key to accomplishing both of these was to revert back to a more youthful adolescent image of both women and men, showing them before they undertook adult responsibilities in their separate spheres of domesticity and work when their lives centered on such co-ed activities as dating and sports. It's revealing, and I hope this is translated well. Um, it's revealing that Gibson's version of the new woman was called a girl, a Gibson girl, not the Gibson woman, and that the two central models for strenuous masculinity that could free men from the emasculation threatened by their female-dominated society were the 19th century cowboy and the newly organized boy scouts. So we're seeing a kind of diminutive going on in the construction of American youth. Okay, the Christie girl debuted in the mass media in the late 1890s, originally as a version of the Gibson girl. But Christie soon transformed her into a college girl whose world centered on her friendships with other girls and sports. And these two activities were considered to make her eventually a better mother. This, this was never um, not the goal of womanhood. Christie believed that the outdoor life was the American girl's secret to beauty and health, and his illustrations show a younger, slimmer woman than Gibson's. The Christie girl was an outdoor pal or playmate, physically fit, athletic, and also a tomboy within the constructs of the time. She's still wearing <clears throat> a corset, so she can't be too fit or too much of a tomboy. Christie's mature work, unlike most of Gibson's, was painted and reproduced in color illustrations, and so his girls have a greater vibrancy and youthfulness than the line drawings that, that um, Gibson usually used. The Fisher girls, um, okay, and you see um, in this one, it's the Gibson girl who is driving. Um, she is having a golf club in her hand. Uh, a whole group of girls are going swimming. And so there's an amount of freedom here that was um, pretty unprecedented. The Fisher girl came into vogue in the magazines between 1905 and 1915. She was well-dressed, genteel, with more rounded features than the more haughty Gibson girl. Both the Christie girl and the Fisher girl were more coquettish than the sexually charged and manipulative siren that was the Gibson girl. Their sexuality was displayed in come-hither glances, let me show you their glances, in come-hither glances, provocative poses, and often revealing clothing. The American girls look out of the images in two ways. Um, one is, and it's on this side, they look out from under lowered eyelids um, that are seductively made up. And the other pose is looking up from a down-tilted chin. Again, a very seductive pose, and interestingly, one that had been favored by Princess Diana. You see it in all of the pictures um, of her. Um, okay, the American girl, the other, um, okay. In both cases, the American girl is a more wholesome adolescent girl next door than the more mature Gibson girls. Although they often wore decollete gowns, they were displaying themselves more as objects of a male gaze rather than the active seductress shown by Gibson and Coles Phillips. Um, I think I have one more, no. Um, 
both Christie and Fisher had momentous popularity with these characters, and they were published not only in all of the periodical press of the day, but they also published books, postcard series, and a whole variety of other um, print media. And I looked on Amazon just out of curiosity, and you can still buy these for fairly reasonable prices, um, the, the, the Christie Girl and the Fisher Girl. Um, so the American Girl became the dominant image of the new woman by 1913. Now, the new woman, of course, needs a new man. Charles Dana Gibson had developed a new man to accompany his Gibson girl, and you see them on the far side. The Gibson new man was clean-shaven to differentiate himself from the whiskered Victorian gentleman. But it is the work of J.C. Landecker who is best, that is best known for depicting the two dominant versions of contemporary men that attempted to redress the crisis of masculinity by recasting the definition of manhood. Men were depicted in Landecker's work as finding danger, risk, and adventure in the realm of consumption. Consumption of both leisure and recreation. One version of the new man depicted sartorial masculinity, featuring, featuring a fashionable young man rising in the corporate world and savvy in the ways of the new consumer culture. And he tends to be quite tall and slender. The other version, heralded as corporal masculinity, um, featured a vigorous young man engaging in recreational team sports, usually team sports, because these were the activities that prepared him for success on a corporate team. Sports, particularly football, became rituals through which men regained their vigor. The Boy Scouts and the YMCA were also founded at this time to provide boys with the means to prove themselves physically, morally, and racially. Men could, re men could redeem their virility through boyish play, while boys became men through structured play. Emerging simultaneously with the new wholesome but flirtatious outdoor college girl and her sports-oriented male pal was the sexually transgressive woman. Um, she is a dangerous woman. Now, the group you're seeing here are the Christie and Fisher girls. If the new American girl depicted by Fish Fisher and Christie was a middle or upper middle class tease who remained a virgin, if not virginal, the dangerous woman was either working class or foreign born, and she used her irresistible sexuality to lure men to their doom. She was variously a party girl who frequented the dance halls, a gold digger, or a vamp. And in all cases, she emasculated and destroyed men. Now, as we know, Gibson had already portrayed the dangerous sexual power of the Gibson girl, who reduced men to tiny pawns in her hand. And this was continued in later magazine illustrations um, by James Montgomery Flagg and Coles Phillips. And you, the one on the far side by Phillips is a play on the word witch. Um, the, the woman is sandwiched between the two men, but she's also the demonic kind of witch. Um, the image down at the bottom is hard to see, but women, the woman is identified with all the favorite um, iconic things like snakes and untamable beasts. And then the flag, it's hard to read it, but it says a woman can make almost, a, a woman can always make almost anything she wants to of a man. Okay, so these are the dangerous women. The vamp is something altogether different. In the hands of a dangerous American girl, men were helpless and the crisis of masculinity was reinforced. In the hands of the vamp, Men were completely destroyed, fueling the fears of a complete demise of virile manhood. Now, I was at the uh, Larco Museum this afternoon, and at the very beginning, there was a stele from the Paco Pompo period in Peruvian history, 1250 BC to 1 AD. And on this stele was a female figure, and it's pointed out that she has a vagina dentata, which is precisely what we're talking about here. So, we're not talking about new inventions, we're talking about a kind of recycled, um, ongoing, periodic fear of women's power. 
Now, the dangerous woman appeared in the print illustrations of the period, but the vamp was developed primarily in the silent movies, beginning with the roles played by Theta Berra, and what you're seeing here is A Fool There Was from 1915, Note Before the War, and then also she developed this character in The Vixen in 1916. Berra continued to play fictional characters based on the vamp for most of her career, which was pretty short. It ended in the mid-1920s, like Carmen in 1915, oops, sorry, or historical women who destroyed powerful men, um, like Cleopatra and Salome. These two films were from 1917 and 1918. The perky Christie and Fisher girls also had their counterparts in entertainment venues, such as the silent movies and cabarets. The dance craze of the early 19-teens featured dancer Irene Castle, who is a perfect, moving embodiment of the American girl. And we see her here with her husband, um, Vernon Castle, who was also an animated version of the new man. Um, he was English, that's a technicality, um, and when England started war, um, he gave up the cakewalk and the tango to enlist and he was killed in action in 1917. Um, Irene married very quickly thereafter, kind of sullying her pure American girl image, but that's another story. Um, the silent movies also introduced animated versions of the new woman and the new man. Um, Mary Pickford, who you're seeing here, um, is another embodiment of the American girl, although technically she was born in Canada, um, but they let that go. Um, and she not only, what you're seeing on the far side is the poster for the film The Little American that came out in 1917. Um, she made propaganda films, and she also went on the, on the campaign trail for the Liberty Bonds and single-handedly raised millions of dollars. Now, the other person who did this was the other major uh, star of the day, Douglas Fairbanks. He raised millions of dollars for the Liberty Loan Drives and his most important accomplishment was a kind of boyish and maniacally kinetic quality. He continued playing youthful characters until he was, I think, in his mid-40s. Um, he, and the images, I kind of cheated, the images at the bottom are from the 20s, because I wanted you to see this kind of really vigorous masculinity um, that he portrayed. And his favorite thing to show how strong he was is that he would put Mary Pickford and Charlie Chaplin on his shoulders and hold them to show how big and strong he was. What is significant is that by the time the United States entered World War I in 1917, there was already an active discourse in the popular media over the construction of contemporary gender roles and by extension, American identity. The very illustrators who Charles David Gibson would choose for war poster assignments had already been interrogating these issues in their commercial work for at least a decade. Even more significant, the American public was familiar with their work and responsive to the identities they were constructing. The war posters literally transposed the familiar commercial civilian American girl and American guy, as depicted by Christie, Fisher, Flagg, and Landecker, into wartime Americans who were all doing their part in the fight to make the world safe for democracy. Just as the commercial media had included everyone in their appeal, so did the wartime posters. Pre-war American media depicted every American as a consumer, and the wartime American media followed suit by depicting every American as an active participant in the war effort. In making the shift from fluctuating gender roles in peacetime to more stable traditional roles in wartime, the, illustri the illustrators reestablished clear models of gender identity that will continue in the decades after the war. And The Little Americans is in the gallery. So part three is forging a new American identity during the war. Three major changes occurred in the depiction of gender identity in the wartime posters that helped to reestablish a sense of stability. One, the flirtatious modern American girl turned her new energies and freedom to the altruistic purposes of serving the war effort. Two, the negative attributes of the dangerous woman, I think I have these here, the negative attributes of the dangerous woman, particularly swords, are turned into positive attributes of powerful, pro-social, allegorical females like Columbia and Liberty. And finally, the role of the soldier 
requiring physical strength and fortitude for combat, provided a model of reinvigorated masculinity based on strenuous work that had been lost since the 1890s. Um, I think, I don't remember how many of these are up. I always keep losing track. Um, the sensuous and flirtatious Christie and Fisher girls appear on war posters that encourage young men to enlist in the different branches of the armed services, as well as on others that are selling liberty bonds, attesting to their appeal to both men and women. In all of these posters, as we saw in the magazine illustrations, the Christie and Fisher girl is shown from a low angle. The viewer looks up at her. She regards us from below her lowered eyelids, which are often shadowed and seductive. Usually her hair is flying loose, and you see that in the I Want You poster. And I just want to make a point that although the, the Christie girls of this period were called flappers, the term actually dates from this decade, um, the only famous woman who has already cut her hair is Irene Castle, who took on the bob in 1915. But the women you're seeing here still have their hair pulled back, but the front is shorter, and that's why it looks like it's flying um, in the breeze. Okay, so her hair is flying loose, her mouth is provocatively open. Um, in most fine art, you don't see teeth, let alone open mouths. Um, and just as often, she's wearing eye-catching garb. Now, we have what looks kind of like cross-dressing when we see the Christie girls appear in the military uniforms. But I just found, um, by digging around, that the Navy actually had a women's ensign division where women actually wore skirted versions of the men's uniforms. Now, it's difficult to tell in the posters if she's wearing a skirt or trousers. Women weren't wearing trousers generally here, and so I don't know if this is women in drag or exactly what, but we see them in provocatively different clothing, and we also see them in diaphanous kind of pseudo-classical garb. Sometimes she curves her body seductively, other times she reaches out um, invitingly to the viewer, She's still modern, sensual, and autonomous, but now she's turning her coquettish charms to the good of the war effort and the American cause. She has repositioned herself back into the patriarchal order, turning her energies away from disruptive and dangerous behaviors to once again subordinate herself to the good cause, and by extension, to the government and traditional female roles. Although the behavioral norms will change for women in the 1920s, the freedom and fluidity of gender roles that characterize the 19 teens will disappear. So it's this pre-war period that women have the greatest flexibility to reinvent themselves, more so than in the 1920s. The dangerous woman, likewise, oh, this is one more, um, and these provocative um, poses, and again, one is a war poster, one is on a women's magazine cover. Um, women were not the only ones who were asked, by the way, um, to participate. Even children were. And these three posters are all up in the gallery. Okay, the dangerous woman, likewise, has her powers reabsorbed into the patriarchy during the war years. Whereas biblical figures who beheaded men, like Salome and Judith of Bethlehem, were very popular cultural variations on the vamp before the war. During the war, women with swords were enlisted to the American cause. And the, my favorite one, this one is not in the exhibition. It's the one in the center where um, it's a poster for, it's by Leigh Decker, it's for the Third Liberty Loan Campaign and the Boy Scouts. And we have this very brawny, this is not Cousin Reginald, but a very brawny Boy Scout handing a gigantic sword to an Amazonian war goddess who is a kind of iconographic mashup of Columbia and the Statue of Liberty. So now the sword becomes the province of women fighting for the country, not against men. Now, if the sensuality of the, of the modern American girl is being used to attract participation in the war effort, participation in war was shown as rejuvenating the manhood of those who fought at home or abroad. 
Babcock's poster on the far side, um, with a sailor riding a torpedo, carries exactly the same meaning as it did in Stanley Kubrick's 1964 Doctor Strangelove, when the character played by Slim Pickens, as you remember, rode the atomic bomb down to its target. Um, okay, the one next to it by Landecker, American, America Calls, this is in the exhibit, shows a square-jawed, clean-cut, muscular sailor being acknowledged for his service by Columbia. That this signifies his reinvigorated manhood is left in little doubt by the position of his bayonet. Okay, you see his bayonet sticking straight up. Um, and I want to remind you that this is not an accident. Freud's writings had already come to America. People were familiar with Freud and he had also lectured in the U.S. by this time. So, the, you know, they knew what they were doing. Here are some more. Um, okay, other posters. Juxtapose guns and men's genital areas to literalize how battle makes a man a man. Um, and so here's just two more. Um, there's tons of these. Once you start looking, it's like, you can't believe that they couldn't find any other iconography. Um, and I have to say that I haven't gone over all the British posters. And so I can't say that it's just America that had sex on its mind, you know, rejuvenated by the war. But even, uh, there was a book done right after the war in 1920 where um, the British posters were discussed and they were compared with the American ones. And even in 1920, the writer says, Oh, the American posters are so much more lively and sensuous. And so there was no missing what these things were talking about. Um, here's just two more in case I haven't proved my point. Um, and these, actually, these are both in the show. Um, and I just want to point out one thing. Um, this poster, you can see it says, Enlist at 8 North Water Street, Rochester. So one of the things we discovered was that the posters were either partly printed centrally, like in Washington, and then they were sent to the different cities all around, and the enlist at CODA was added at the bottom. Sometimes it's a separate piece of paper added, but a lot of the posters, because they came from the Rochester Historical Society, who was just given all the leftover posters because the war ended before people had thought it would. Um, so a lot of the ones you'll see up in the gallery do have Rochester addresses, um, which got us very excited, of course. And then, oh, here's two more. Um, I got carried away. Um, one really famous one is the one on the far side where not only do we have upright things, but one man is actually straddling another man's leg. And I won't even go into Leyendecker's biography because that even adds more fuel to the flames. Um, but you get my point. And you know, those of you who know your movie history, um, Sergei Eisenstein's Potemkin um, has a very famous sequence where the lions stand up and the guns have a gigantic erection. And so this is very common in this period. It's just that for some reason the war posters seem to have this sacred quality about them and nobody has looked at this. Okay, it's not only combat, but it's physical labor. Um, and in Flag's image on the far side, Together We Win, um, we see that active, strenuous work, whether it's on the battlefield or the home front, is equally energizing. And you see the one in the center, the a mine more coal, where the pick and the gun are still placed in the same place, rivets are bayonets, you know, we see this over and over. And then finally, this marvelous poster, um, Fourth Sights, and they thought we couldn't fight. Now, this really shows to me that this idea of reinvigorated manhood translates into the rise of a new national power. And this is kind of, you know, if the lions of Delos rise in Potemkin, this is American manhood saying, I am man. Um, the imagery in the wartime posters reconcile, reconcile the conflicting gender roles that had been manifest in the mass media for more than two decades in the US and helped to forge an American identity that restored clarity and purpose after a period of flux and anxiety. A 20th century man had been created out of the ashes of the 19th century, which restored a sense of national identity, agency, and purpose. 
This, on top of the multiple multitude of changes and realignments in political power after the war, helped to usher in what would come to be called, um, by the 1940s, the American century. Thank you.